that's the eye of the hurricane for that. And so they coordinate the clusters between themselves. And we work with the UN agencies that are already in the country, as well as with government. So our main counterpoint in, in any of these emergency responses is the government. Um, and so, yeah, so when I was working with OCHA, what I was doing is the um, data analysis part of that. So basically what we're doing is humanitarian needs analysis in order to uh, evaluate and do some advocacy and uh, request funding for different types of emergencies based on actual capacity on the ground or capacity like regionally to deploy locally within the country uh, rapidly. That could be deployment of people or of uh, humanitarian goods. Um, so then I mentioned not only I worked with OCHA, I had the chance to work with um, UNFPA, uh, which is the organization that is, sorry, the UN agency, which is specialized in um, population and women and children's rights. Uh, so that was a really interesting experience. I got to go to Bangladesh, work with um, the Rohingya Muslims uh, that were displaced in 2017. I was there a year later. So the refugee camp of 700,000 people was already kind of built up and we were working with 19 women friendly spaces uh, and so the data component of that comes because the 19 friendly spaces women friendly spaces uh, sorry we were trying to quantify the qualitative information that was coming out of those 19 women friendly spaces and so we were using some technological tools but at the same time we also had to figure out you know bamboo uh, lodgings and then the monsoon and so there was a kind of a mix of a lot of different things and so i was thanks <laughs> I was handling a lot of different new pieces of information, but then applying from one mission to the next a little bit, uh, the experience and the knowledge that I gathered. So it's been quite a trip. I'm currently working in Honduras. Uh, I've got, I got a lot of chats because I speak Spanish. And so yeah, Venezuela, Ecuador, Honduras, Cuba. So I've been specializing a little bit in Latin America, but uh, who knows where the next mission will be. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Malian, and over to you, uh, Siam. Hi everyone. I, I want to thank uh, Ali for the invitation and for everyone uh, being with us this uh, early evening, late afternoon. Uh, so my name is Siam Rial, and as Ali said, I'm a women's rights policy and advocacy specialist at Oxfam Canada. And my focus areas are on humanitarian emergencies and refugee rights. I'm based in Toronto or Takaranto, which is a traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Uh, so, you know, my, I haven't, I've been at Oxfam for about this, uh, this August will be a year. Uh, prior to that, I was actually teaching at the University of Toronto here uh, in the Department of uh, Women and Gender Studies. Uh, as uh, cross uh, as well as African studies, um, I have a PhD from SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies from the UK, and I'm recently I'm completing a, an LLM, a Master's in Law and International Law and Human Rights, with a focus on transitional justice in conflict post conflict uh, settings and environments. Uh, much of my experience working in the field has come from doing research. So my strengths and background is as a research consultant uh, for much of my career. As soon as I finished my PhD, which was in 2015 and feels like ages ago under COVID, um, <laughs> uh, as soon as I finished and during my PhD as well, I was traveling throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, working in uh, mainly East Africa, but in immediate post-conflict environments, uh, particularly in the Horn, working with civil society, local civil society organizations, regional civil society organizations, and, you know, doing, offering my research skills. And some of that included doing capacity building uh, workshops and facilitations, uh, developing toolkits uh, uh, and workshops uh, around capacity building and, uh, you know, doing needs assessments. Eventually, I was doing project and program evaluation for different organizations. Uh, and my expertise really lies at the intersection of women, peace and security and really, um, you know, finding ways of including women in uh, peace processes and in, in the immediate post-conflict uh, process. So I have worked in environments that have been uh, incredibly uh, difficult and volatile for 
different reasons, part of which uh, involves active conflict. So much of my experience has been um, not only how to navigate these environments, but when to leave. <laughs> uh, even as the project is ongoing and even as the requirements of your contract are ongoing. Uh, so that's something that definitely um, I can speak to in, in, in any questions that uh, participants might have about, you know, how do you build a career um, in such incredibly um, insecure and volatile contexts, but also how do you work with communities that are oftentimes uh, highly mobile uh, and have been, you know, forcibly dis or immediately displaced. And I think I share in that experience with uh, Emily. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation and getting to know everybody. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to connect. Thanks so much, Sam. Will, over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Ali. And, and I'm also very pleased to be with you uh, this evening for the CIC Career Expo. And I think um, early on in my career, I think I wish I had sought out events like this um, to, to, to understand more about how to embark on an international career path. And most of our time, of course, is devoted to Q&A, but I'll start like the others with a summary of my background and career path. And as Ali mentioned, I, I'm currently at the World Bank Group based in Washington, DC, but I'll get into my current role a bit later on. Um, my career path is, is not straightforward at all. It's a really, it, it's a real zigzag windy road um, that I'll describe to you. And I, I had an idea of where I wanted to end up uh, working for the public good in an international organization, but I don't think that I could have predicted where I ended up with the team I'm in right now at the World Bank uh, starting out. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my studies in case that's of interest, and then I'll get into the career path. So I did my undergraduate degree in international studies and economics at Glendon College of York University, which is a small campus of York that's bilingual, helped me improve and maintain my French was something that Emily um, ha had discussed um, in, in her presentation, the, the, the importance of, 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 um, of language and then went to the London School of Economics for a master's in public policy and public administration, where my thesis was the role of the Rwandan public service in the 1994 genocide. Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit about my, uh, my work with respect to Rwanda a bit later on, but I contemplated a PhD at that point, but decided that a law degree was useful if I wanted to go into advocacy and, and human rights work. So I pursued my legal studies at McGill and the McGill program is bilingual. It's a dual degree, both common law and civil law. And this was quite useful um, for my work uh, later on at the UN and also my current work at the World Bank with countries who have a civil law tradition. Um, and while at McGill, I pursued an international human rights internship um, at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, uh, which is the tribunal that was set up after the Rwanda genocide to try those who are accused of being most responsible for the, for the genocide. And this ended up being valuable later on, um, as I'll describe. So starting out in the, the legal working world, I, I took a total left turn and uh, decided that a good training for me would be in corporate law. So I worked for a number of years as a corporate lawyer in capital markets and, uh, markets and insolvency at Clifford Chance uh, in London, England, which is a big international law firm. And I was there during the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. So there were many innovative things happening. And uh, the years I spent with really long hours at the firm turned out, I think, to be really good training um, subsequently for my legal work. Um, and a lot of international organizations do like you to already have some experience in your area and training before you join. Um, and I learned that, that later on, we can discuss that in the Q&A. Um, so I, I knew that my time at the law firm would be temporary and uh, I ultimately wanted to go back into the public service. So I had a longstanding interest in, in the Rwandan genocide um, and, and the, the situation surrounding it. So um, I applied for a staff position at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and took a leave absence from my firm and became the legal and policy advisor to the president of the tribunal, actually to two presidents and, and worked in, I was based in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, which is an amazing country. Um, and, um, and, and really with the president, I was involved in advising um, him on relations with countries, internal strategy, legal decisions. It was a fascinating position. Um, 
and uh, it was really a, a dream job. But I decided to come back to Canada. Um, sorry, Ali, I know I have one minute left, but I may go a little bit over because <laughs> as you see, it's really, it is a zigzag path. Um, and, and the tribunal was winding down because it was an ad hoc tribunal. So I looked back to Canada for my next opportunity to come back home for a little bit, which was important to me. And I returned to Canada through something called the Recruitment of Policy Leaders Program, which brings Canadians with specialized education experience back into the federal public service in a mid to senior level role. And um, you can be placed in almost any federal uh, department in a policy role. And uh, the government, once you're admitted, brings you to Ottawa to, to meet with departments and, and also provides you with a mentor. I ended up working at the um, Canadian Department of Finance in the, in the financial sector um, area, uh, working back on financial sector issues like I did at Clever Chance. So coming back to that. Um, and after three years there, I missed, I really missed my work in, in international public service. So got a short-term consultancy with the World Bank um, in, in DC with the team I'm in now. Um, but those short-term positions are quite um, tenuous and, and difficult to maintain. So um, after a bit, I, I ended up in a staff position at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London, um, in the Office of the General Counsel. So going back to a legal, more of a legal position. And um, within a few years, my team at the World Bank um, had an opening for a full-time staff position. I don't think that that had come up for seven years before then. Uh, so it it's, uh, takes a long time to get these staff positions. And, um, and, and I was able to rejoin my team, which is a team that focuses on insolvency and debt resolution. So helping countries to improve their insolvency, uh, domestic insolvency frameworks uh, to improve their access to finance and financial inclusion. And the World Bank, just in case people don't know, is a, the mission is, 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 is really a world free of poverty. And we work with developing countries around the world, providing um, lending and also financial and technical assistance in a wide range of areas from healthcare to financial sector, which I work in. Um, and I work mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but we're a small team of five people. We work in, right now we have country, uh, projects in 50 countries. So I work um, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but all around the world if, if required. Um, anyway, that's a lot of information. I hope it was useful. And I'm happy to, uh, I'm looking forward to and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. So I guess with that, we'll, we'll jump right into the questions here. And so I see that there's a lot of questions about education. So I guess, uh, I guess the first question here is, are there any particular degrees or programs that the three of you would recommend to students or young professionals aspiring to work at an international organization or, or NGO? So the floor is yours, uh, whoever wants to jump in first. I mean, I, I can take I can take a first um, first go at answering the question. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily. It depends on because international organizations um, have such different roles. It really depends on what role you're interested in 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 the future. And really, I, I would I would say that almost any um, any degree or any area is required in an international organization. It does help, I think, to have. Um, I started out with a bachelor's in in international studies. And that really helped me, I think, to understand the role of international organizations and um, understand um, the, the world a bit more than, than I would have without that kind of education. But um, to, to, to me, I think, I think the, the, the key is to, is to do something that you're really passionate about. And, um, and if you're passionate about it, um, th there's definitely going to be um, a, a space for you in an international organization um, that, that deals with that particular issue because there's there's so many so many issues that that international organizations deal with. Thanks. Well, see, I'm, uh, and while I'm asking, you know, on top of educational requirements or degrees, uh, anything about languages as well. Whether you feel that's a requirement or whether there's any specific languages that you think uh, make you more competitive as a candidate. Uh, so I'm going to, I, I don't speak French, so I'm going to let Emily speak to that uh, because she has a, an impressive background in languages, but to compliment Will's comments. Um, so yes, I think if you do have, your undergraduate degree can be anything, um, really and truly. You could be, you know, a statistician, you could have a statistics undergraduate degree if you felt like it. And I think the important thing is if you have, if you have a real keen interest in, um, international affairs, whether that's, you know, global development, um, international law, um, uh, you know, 
really environmental studies and, and that includes environmental science. Um, you know, there's, I think what's really great about um, higher education today is that there are certificates uh, that you can take both from outside of the university and college environment, but also within it to help you specialize and really kind of focus on, on issue areas that are really you're really keen about. Some of that is area studies. So you might just have a keen interest in Southeast Asian studies. Some of that might include um, language uh, and that in and of itself is really important. Uh, and other times that just might include issue areas. So, you know, at York University, they have uh, a certificate in uh, refugee and forced displacement, right? And I know that the University of Ottawa has that as well. So I think, um, you know, your experiences are really what I have found bring you to where you are. And your keen interest will continue to evolve and drive, you know, the choices that you make. And part of those choices include the issue areas that you want to inform and learn about. Um, as an educator, because prior to coming to Oxfam, and I think throughout since I got my PhD, I've really found a way to maintain a relationship with, um, you know, with universities and have continued to teach, including teaching in the Horn of Africa and in East Africa in general. Um, you know, so much of what uh, sometimes we have a tendency to pack degrees on top. Uh, and, and to kind of create this very lovely and neat package, which is still, you know, it's, it's valuable. Get, get the degrees that you're really passionate about. Um, but at the same, but I think, you know, to say that there's experience and experience oftentimes really is your best teacher. And if you have an opportunity to do some kind of certificate or other professional development course or program, and you can find a way to fit it in, that, that sometimes can be much more valuable than, than what you might be learning in, in, in classroom. So um, over to my colleague, Emily. Sure, thanks, Yam. Uh, for the language, maybe I'll get back to that, but I guess the only thing I would add is what I've noticed, at least in the humanitarian response sector is rather than looking at what degree should you take, it's kind of the economic analysis of, what are they looking for or what is the industry looking for and and i can tell you that if you're a nutritionist or a water engineer and you want to go work for the humanitarian sector instantly you're good we'll plug you in <laughs> it's so some of the technical fields there's a lot of need for that and there's a kind of a cylindrical way of looking at things and so we'll study international studies and, and i did international law and i, I think you know it, it comes from that desire of looking beyond our world and all that but at the same time some of those jobs that can seem more local when those are the most, you know, that they were looking for. One of my friends works for Telecommunications Sans Frontières, so uh, they're restoring internet and networks after earthquakes and stuff, but he could be doing IT here, but for example, he's going to go do IT in an earthquake event affected area. Uh, so that, I know, I think that adds on to, I guess, what Siam and Will were saying is find something that you really enjoy and that you really want to look for like international studies is something but then you have to go get another technical skill uh, statistics is great also for that one <laughs> um for the language i'm gonna say again that it's more of a question of um I i'm lucky because i of course i i was born in, into a bilingual household so i learned the french and then the spanish was easy but i, I did make a, a grave mistake that uh, all of my undergraduate i studied chinese <laughs> which was fantastic everyone should learn chinese it's great there's not a lot of international humanitarian jobs related to that because they're not really, uh, there's not really a lack of people who speak Chinese in that sector. Not yet anyways, maybe in the World Bank, I'll ask Will a little bit later on. But uh, I think, you know, for those who are looking for maybe a career specifically in the humanitarian, French unfortunately remains uh, a really, you know, easy way in. Um, Spanish, we're always desperate for people who speak Spanish and who have the capacity. I'm looking for a coordinator right now in Honduras kind of thing because there's a kind of a gap uh, in people who have that technical, ex uh, technical knowledge as well as the language skills. So it's more, I think, that if you only have one language, uh, it, it's like an additional obstacle. Uh, and so it can, be, it can be very discouraging when that's the, the blocking point, even if you have all this great knowledge and technical skills. Um, to give, so. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, our next question here, and it's it's related. Uh, any advice on applying for a job or getting your foot in the door with your organization? And I guess as, as another quick tack on to that question is, 
you know, in terms of, you know, doing your education, do you recommend going right to graduate studies or, or are you able to get your foot in the door without having a, a master's nowadays? Uh, I guess we'll, we'll start with, uh, with CM. Um, so to the second question about do you need, uh, do you need to go right into graduate studies? If you feel like it, um, I think this, so much of this is driven by interest, opportunity, but also your circumstances, right? Uh, there's plenty of people that can't afford to take time off and, you know, get an internship somewhere in Geneva because, you know, back in the day, I don't know if Geneva is still a thing, right? You, you guys can tell me, but, um, you know, there's, there was such a drive in my, when I was in my undergrad for to get that internship to Geneva. It didn't matter what uh, international institution that you were working for. But you know, there's the financial means, there's really like structural barriers that that can prevent you from really fulfilling the things that you want to fulfill. Uh, if that's your, if that's, you know, your prop, your, if that, if that's an actual issue for you. And for other people, you know, it's, they're, they're interested in graduate studies, because, you know, that one uh, educator, you know, really drove their interest in a particular issue surrounding international affairs. It was that one course, and that might be the path that they want to take. And for others, it's about time, right? It's it's really about, well, I want I know I want to get a law degree. I don't want to be in school forever. So I'm going to go get a law degree. And there's practical and rational considerations to do that. So if you feel like it, um, you should do it. And I think be comforted in knowing that, you know, you, you will be able to, as I think uh, our colleague Will has pointed out, some things are straightforward and some things take you forward and backwards and round and round and it can still be a very fulfilling experience. So that's that. What was the first question? I'm so sorry. No, no, the first, I'm sorry for asking all these questions all at once, but the, the question no. was essentially, no, no, so, so this question is how do you get your foot in the door at, at Oxfam, at other NGOs, at other international organizations? Right. So I think it, it goes back to what Emily had said um, about ensuring that you have the right qualifications and the right skills. Right. So, um, you know, if you don't speak French and you apply for a job where it's a bilingual position, um, that's not helpful and very likely not going to help you keep that job. Um, but if, you know, so making sure that you have the right credentials that, that they're asking for, but also the right experience, right? Um, that's really critical. So fulfilling, you know, just whatever the job specifications are. And then I think the other bit is, um, and now it's been made more easy, is to be able to do that outreach, you know, that send that email, send that message through LinkedIn, connect with folks through Facebook, uh, interact with them on Twitter, consider, you know, if, if they happen to be someone that's very public public facing that presents ideas that you're really interested in, comment and have that conversation and, you know, send that message and that e e before you could only, I'm aging myself, but I promise I'm a millennial, you know, before you could only, I, we sent emails, right, or had cold calls, but now there's, you know, a lot of these social media platforms are open for use and still very, people are very, very, very accessible. Um, and, and are really excited when people reach out uh, in these ways, even if they can't help you, they'll point you to someone who can, right? And you never lose anything by having a conversation like that. So, yeah. Thanks, Ian. Emily Ann, any advice on getting your foot in the door and, and about whether to take a break between your undergrad and, and graduate studies? Oh, I really hesitated about that one. I'm going to agree with CM that it really depends on kind of where you are in your life. Uh, I jumped straight into it because I had an undergrad in history and as fascinating as it is, I didn't find it to be particularly operationally useful. So I was kind of like, okay, what can we do with this now? <laughs> but uh, if you're if you're continuing something that you were doing in your in your undergrad, then I think it, it, it can be worthwhile. If Honestly, if you have, like Sam was saying, the time to go get the practical experience before getting your master's degree, I see a lot of value in that. But it, it takes a lot of, you know, lining up uh, quite a few circumstances. Uh, as for getting your foot in the door, I, I have to say that I'm absolutely guilty of the stars aligning because I, I was just, I was in Nepal in 2015 when there's the earthquake. And so I was just kind of there and we had to take shelter on the floor of the UNICEF building. And then those, what I, what I still see as kind of superhero, the real life superheroes came in as everyone was fleeing the country, they flew in and with their big boxes of, of, um, things to help initially the the emergency rescue teams and the emergency medical teams and they were flying in and I saw them coming in and I was like wow what is this this is so cool and 
you, you, that's a hard thing to to replicate. So I'm not going to give you the advice of flying in when there's the next earthquake. Um, I, I got my my first internship with uh, UNAC, as I was mentioning earlier, and I, I took a look at their website, and I don't know that they still offer um, these internships. And so on top of that, I'm going to say that it was during the Harper era. So I'm, I'm going to age myself as well a little bit. Um, and I had to pay to get into that internship. So not only was it not paid, I had to pay for the flight, the insurance, you know, possibly visa, whatever, yeah, vaccines. I had to pay just for the right to participate. And at the time it was 2,500. It, it was, you know, I, I was working full time. I was studying full time. So I, I have the luck of having that energy to do both at the same time, but uh, it's not something that's a given. And it's, it was a, a privilege to get to do it, but I still think that, uh, I, I don't know. It was a, it was a, di a di it was a difficult internship. So I think there's other UN internship types um, but unfortunately, the type of work that I do with Canada right now, as well as I don't know if anyone's ever stumbled upon the UNV, UN volunteers, um, they're really looking for people with experience because they're looking just not to have to do that initial kind of like, are you really able to, you know, put in the work effort? Do you have the, the, the collaboration, the compatibility, that kind of like the first work years are a little bit difficult. And so they're looking for people with experience. And so UNVs are not really, uh, but it's great because it's paid. It's a volunteer position, but it's paid because there's a recognition of that experience. And then Siam, you were talking about the internships. The internships, not paid, no experience, but also very difficult um, to get into. So yeah, I would say like the main advice is do look through all the websites, look at what type of profiles they're looking for. Skills, but also just the themes. Thanks, Emily. And Will? Yes, just 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 a bit to add to that, because that's all very good advice, I think. Um, I think I would just say to kind of look for opportunities. I know for me, the first major opportunity I had was um, when I was in law school, this human rights internship, which was fully funded by the by McGill. So I was able to get funding for the summer to go to work at the UN tribunal. And, um, and that was an application process. And, 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 and that kind of got my foot in the door, gave me some experience in, in international organization and also provided me with those, the contacts, um, which networking of course is, is extremely important and keeping up uh, your contacts as well. Even if you're moving around, um, leaving on a good, good note and, and keeping up your contacts, uh, checking in on people I think is, is really important. The, the other thing I would say is, um, um, opportunities, you know, like CIC and and other uh, conferences and events where you can um, go when 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 COVID is under control, go in person um, and and meet up with people and have a coffee and connect and try and find other Canadians at international organizations too. I mean, use um, use those um, the, the, those connections and and reach out to people. I think you'd be surprised at how open people are to to talking to you uh, through LinkedIn. I've got many many uh, requests for connections, and I always respond I always uh, make time for the people so I think that um, you know you use all those means and 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 it's a, a good good method to kind of um, get get your foot in the door and and understand a bit more about the um, the rules that are available in international organizations and after having spoken to someone I mean that I, I I got my short-term consultancy at, at, at the World Bank um, through a bunch of networking and someone just thought oh I know someone who you should speak to based on your experience and then I got connected to someone so um, uh, I think that happens to to a lot of people. Thank you and I think Siam wants to jump in here. Um, just no, really, just a really more compliment than anything else. Um, and I can't say this enough now is more often than not, um, we feel like when we're at the start, start of any career, and I started off as an intern at Plan Canada. So let me put that in there, because we're talking about internships. Um, but to start off, it all, you know, you, you are your best advocate. And oftentimes there's a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit that has to go along with really advocating for yourself. I don't like the word selling yourself because you're not a commodity, right? You have skills, you have um, ideas, you have lived experience in a reality that's very, very valuable that can be commodified, which is fine. Everyone works for a wage, right? Um, but I oftentimes it really is just, you know, seeking out the networks that 
you have idealized, right? And, and really modeling your career or your interests as you start off from someone that you admire um, and really kind of, you know, just reaching out to them, as Will said, um, you know, he's kind enough to connect, right? And he's, I've got such an impressive resume and CV, um, but, you know, we're all we're all here in this environment and really demystifying many of these processes. So um, it can be very difficult at the very beginning to really say what are the right words, how do I frame what I'm doing. Um, but you know, a bit of luck, a bit of authenticity, and a bit of that entrepreneurial spirit to let people know I'm offering something, but I and I and I want something back which is that experience, that those credentials, um, that connection. Sometimes you just want to connect with people. And I think that's really valuable, but I also understand very difficult to commodify and to say, I, you know, I talked to this person, therefore I got a job, right? And sometimes it doesn't work like that, but that attitude and that spirit is, is you know, really, it, it's the kind that draws people to you. Totally. No, and I can say that I'm, I'm guilty of that as well, because I mean, when I was looking at the Recruitment and Policy Leaders Program, Will was on my radar as someone with a, a law background, RPL, working with the government. So I, you know, I messaged him on LinkedIn. I said, Will, can we have a chat? So I, it works. You know, it's good. I think we all learn from each other and we're all really committed to paying it forward. Uh, another question here. What does a typical career advancement or trajectory look like in an international organization or an NGO? And again, whoever wants to jump in, feel free to feel free to jump in first. I can also name one of you. So I'll I can oh. tell a small uh, maybe anecdote uh, because Will was mentioning that it, uh, before you got your current. Uh, Permanent, semi-permanent. Uh, anyway, it's your full time. Ter term, term, staff position. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> staff position. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, until you were able to have that opening, it was seven years. Um, but that's, I guess, with uh, headquarters in Washington, as you were mentioning, right? Because one of the things I've I've been noticing at the UN is the further afield you go, kind of the more likely that the doors will open up. And so I had only had about three years of experience. Um, when I was offered a full term two year contract uh, with UNFPA because they really liked the work I was doing because you're there, you're kind of showing your grit and, and your capacity on the floor. Um, but it's through doing these shorter internships and smaller contracts that I even got the chance to get that exposure. Um, but once again, that wasn't even in the capital. And uh, this is another question I think in, in the list for uh, eventually, and we were talking about work life balance and the location right next to the refugee camps was very difficult for me uh, to be completely honest. I, we were not allowed out after 8 p.m. So curfew is not new for me. Like COVID is great, but I've been doing this, right? So <laughs> uh, we weren't allowed out after 8 p.m. And then there was a really big cultural shift for me to be uh, in Bangladesh, but not in the capital. Like I was in a smaller city, uh, town even. It was, I couldn't even go to the market without the harassment. And, and I was groped, for example. Like, so there's all these different things. And so I was like, three months, great learning experience. I will remember it until it, it's really the mission that stood out for me, like one of the, one of the top. But pondering a two-year contract in that one little city, I was like, yes, I could do great things, but this is not where I am right now. And so in terms of advancement, there was that possibility. And so I think going directly into like the deep field uh, is a great way to do so, but it was not, it was not for me personally. That's, that's one pathway. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would say also that that field experience is really good. And also um, having that field experience, I think, is really important for people who want to be in HQ eventually of these organizations because they really do look for the field experience. Um, I think also just um, and, and it's easier said than done in many cases, but um, be, being able to to 
take some risks and um, you know, if, if you can take the one year contract or the two year contract to kind of build the experience because um, that's what, again, will give you the network and, um, and the experience that others are looking for to hire you on in a more permanent way. And I mean, that's, you know, that's how I kind of had to, I mean, I, I'd, been, I'd been a practicing lawyer for many years and took a short-term consultancy contract at the World Bank um, to be able to have that experience. Not everyone feels comfortable doing that. I understand that and it's, um, uh, it's 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 again a, a tenuous um, position, um, but if 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 you can, especially early on in your career, take some risks and um, take those shorter term uh, positions, then I think that really helps you to build this kind of CV that people are looking for uh, later on. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would largely agree with what my colleagues have said, and I think just to reiterate that. These issues about um, access, right? Access are also connected to privilege, right? So it is a privilege to be sitting here and having this conversation with all of you um, and, and to have had all the experience that I have had uh, and managed to have had. But as Emily Ann had said, uh, there's challenges as well. Part of, that, part of your challenges in being able to access the right networks are going to be, you know, are you willing to fly out at the drop of a hat in very dangerous uh, environments that might not be possible for you? Um, you know, are you willing to be able to, you know, have your movements limited um, because you're in a disaster area, speaking of humanitarian emergencies, and that can take a toll on your mental health? Um, and years and years of doing that might not be um, what you had envisioned or, or what works out for you. Um, so I think in terms of access, it's very difficult to find a, it's very difficult to give a, a typical path to how to get it, that internship, that ideal job. Um, and fundamentally, it's not your fault, right? It, unfortunately, I grew, I grew up in the Harper era too. <laughs> And I graduated from my undergrad as soon as the 2008 recession hit, which was just, it was a terrible time to be doing any kind of social science degree uh, because you couldn't really market so-called technical skills. So, um, you know, you, you are taking those short-term contracts and hoping that that contract gets extended and hoping that the next contract gets extended. When I was doing my PhD, I had partial funding so I was doing a lot of research, just to give it so how I got here, I was doing a lot of research consultancies, uh, including a few with the World Bank. Um, but that was also right time, right place, as Emily Ann said. Uh, so that wasn't something that could be predict, that was, I could predict. But I saw an opportunity, I tried to take advantage of it, and I consistently tried to market the skills that I did have um, to the best of my ability. So I think it's recognizing that there are limitations and barriers that are outside of your control. Um, but I, I, I also think that as an early career uh, individual, um, you know, whether you're still in, in pursuing your higher education degree in graduate school, have, have just finished, et cetera, um, you know, I think making sure that you're investing in that time period and really, really figuring out looking up the places that you want, that you think you want to be at and potentially want to be at and having conversations with people, um, you know, that, that, that you, you believe can help you network um, is really, really valuable to kind of filtering out what it is that you might not really be interested in um, because an opportunity, taking an opportunity for the sake of taking an opportunity might be your reality and you might have to do that and you should. No, um, you know, opportunities lead to other opportunities. But there's also, if you have the time, if you have the patience, if you have the capability, if you have the ability, there's also a value in really asking more questions, including going to organizations. I saw a question in the Q&A about inclusion. It's also about going to organizations and individuals and asking about their policies around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, to get an understanding of what their hiring practices are like. Oftentimes you get hired and these things become demystified. Fine, great. But if it's not where you really want to be and it's an opportunity for the sake of an opportunity, you can ask these questions um, and, and really start tailoring uh, the, the, the space to, to your needs and, and start tailoring your search to your needs. If, if I could just add something um, to that as well, I think that 
um, you know, something that I, I learned on the career path is that, um, and seeing from, from other people as well, is that short-term positions are great and it's great to get your foot in the door, but they're not great to continue on with, with one short-term position after the next and not knowing where you're going. So I think um, for me and for others who I've spoken to, it's important to kind of have in mind when you're going to um, kind of stop um, on, on the kind of short-term wheel and, and get off and, 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 and try and try and find something more, more permanent, even if it's not in the international space, because I think a lot of people end up finding themselves on this pathway of just short-term contracts. And, and that can be, I mean, for some people it's, it's, it's great, but for many people, um, it comes without a lot of benefits, um, and it can be, uh, very difficult to, to, to live year to year on, on those kinds of short-term contracts. Emily, Ann, I see you nodding along. Is there anything you want to add on that one before we jump to the next question? No, it's just really interesting. Uh, I, I agree with what Will is saying. It was just reflecting upon kind of how that's done in the humanitarian field. Because, like, I mean, we, we're always doing disaster response. Although there's always a core of some of my colleagues who are there to do the whole cycle of like preparedness response and then the after study and then so there are there are that core of, of people who get deployed whether for regional uh, or headquarters but um, yeah it's uh, there's, there's definitely different different pathways yeah. Great. Uh, so our next question here and it's related to what we've we've heard. I guess what do you wish you had known about the field or the organization you're in before you started? Any takers? So that's really difficult to answer. Go on, Emilia. No, no, you go ahead, Siam. <laughs> um, no, I've just, I, I think that's very difficult to answer simply because um, so much of my life experiences have, have informed my choice to work here and my desire to apply uh, when the opportunity presented itself. So um, I think when I think about my, my career trajectory and my whole, the span of my career over the last 12, 13 years, I, I would think, sometimes I think, what would I tell myself right after undergrad? What would I tell myself after my PhD? What would I tell myself? Because I, I, I came back to Canada a couple of years ago, so at different points, I told myself something a little different. Um, and I think the consistent thread has always been, um, you know, that you are, you are your own expert, right? You, whatever expertise that you think that um, you need, you probably have, uh, unless it's a very technical expertise, right? I'm, you know, I'm not a statistician and I admire statisticians. So uh, that, that's different, but, you know, certainly just apply, reach out, connect, um, and, and see where that takes you. I wish I had done more, I wish I had done that more often um, without having to tag it to the immediate need uh, to find a new job, like Will said, because your short-term contract was ending. Thank you, Emily. Um, in regards to your question, like Sam said, I think it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's definitely personal. I'm going to say that I think I learned more about myself than I did, even though I got, you know, such a chance to learn a lot about, about the international organizations and the countries I lived in. But I think I myself was transformed more by these experiences. And then, so it's hard to kind of reimagine what would I tell myself seven years ago about this whole entire span that I've been on. But then, you know, I was, I was thinking about, um, a lot of people started asking me as soon as I was working for the UN, like, oh, wow, how do I get in? And, and or conversely, a lot of people were saying, oh, well, the UN, you know, they're kind of controversial. And then so there's that that kind of negative aspect. And my takeaway that has remained true, regardless of which country or which organization I was within, and I've been in some that were not my favorite, you know, so it's been really different. But um, it in all the contexts that I've been in, there's always been at least one or two persons who uh, inspired me uh, by their their real like devotion to the the mission and the values and the goals of the UN? I'm I'm still fascinated and and you know I I'm really grateful that the UN even exists. I think it's it still blows my mind that all these countries that are fighting on so many aspects, but then that there was this kind of communal will at some point to 
create something that is beyond uh, state sovereignty. And then so kind of like just that tying that into some individuals who uphold those morals and those values and who really push for it, who advocate, I think I've been lucky enough to have enough of those, I wouldn't say necessarily mentors, but they are the people who kind of keep me inspired to keep doing uh, what I'm doing. I don't know if that really answers the question. That's my takeaway. Thanks, I, I, I would say something very similar. I think it's, you know, in all these organizations, you find all sorts of different people, but finding the people who inspire you and um, who are there for really for good, I think um, is a way to propel yourself forward because there'll be in an international career, there'll be a lot of very difficult challenges that you face. Um, and CM talked a little bit about, you know, th those, and also I Emily mean, Ann talked about a little bit about those challenges, including, you know, personal safety challenges, lots of different challenges that, that, that you may face in international career and being able to find the people who can help you get through those, I think um, is extremely important and to reach out to those people. And I, I wish I had done that a bit more um, beginning um, in, in, in my career. And in my particular circumstances, I'm, I'm gay and, um, you know, moving to a country where I had to go back in the closet was very hard for me. And, um, you know, I thought about that a little bit before um, making the move, but I didn't know what it was going to be like until I did. And it was, it ended up being very hard. Um, so, um, you know, finding those people who can help you through those hard times, I think is really important. Thanks. I think we have time for about two more questions, 10 minutes left. Um, I guess, what do you see as the major uh, issues or trends in the field today or over the next coming years in your organization? I see Emily Ann thinking. <laughs> Anyone want to jump in here first? So, yeah. I'm going to jump in really quickly just because I was working on this this morning. Um, so, in, and Emily Ann will be familiar with this as well because the humanitarian sector is undergoing its, you know, grand bargain review. Um, so, uh, you know, part of the post COVID environment. So what's the post COVID environment going to look like for humani the humanitarian sector uh, and particularly, you know, issues around international assistance and how much of that uh, might be limited uh, to, uh, you know, communities and environments where already assistance was badly needed um, and ensuring that you know, the humanitarian uh, sector is it decimated in a post-COVID context when we know that a lot of nations are going to be looking inward to strengthen, um, you know, their economic, uh, strengthen their, their economic uh, infrastructures. So um, oftentimes that means I'm lobbying my government, uh, my the Canadian government to push for expanded debt relief. I'm looking at you, Will. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also trying to maintain and really bolster that uh, international assistance uh, budget to, you know, make sure that people that are already falling through uh, the cracks aren't uh, going to be, you know, these, these uh, emergencies and these environments aren't further decimated by a lack of uh, support. So, yeah, that, and that comes top of mind just because I was working on that this morning. For me, COVID um, as well. I mean, I, I work in the insolvency space, and so the lockdowns have um, created uh, a potential for a huge number of insolvencies uh, and a lot of financial distress. So that takes up a lot of my time, 14 hours a day right now of my time. Um, but uh, beyond that, of course, climate is extremely um, important and something that we're working on a lot um, at, at, at the bank. Um, the, the, those um, those two areas um, are, are uh, among many many areas. That, I mean, the bank works on every area that the a public service would work on, um, but those two areas in particular. Emily, uh, maybe just I I totally agree with CM. Thanks for bringing bringing that up. And you were wondering also about the internships in Geneva. I believe that some of the UN headquarters from in Geneva have moved to Istanbul, which is also a fantastic city. So maybe the the internships can be <laughs> elsewhere. But anyways, to come back to, to uh, you know, the humanitarian response, this, they've been struggling for the past few years. And I think the UN agencies such as um, WHO has never gotten as much media attention, obviously, as since since 
COVID, COVAX was a bit of a, I don't want to say a failure, but it was, it was not the success that it should have been, that it could have been. Um, and UNICEF has never been stronger in their, in their technical capacity to monitor and to respond quickly. They've got, you know, they're catching up to WFP in terms of logistics and stuff. So there's maybe a shifting away from the hyper-coordinated humanitarian response that we saw like five, 10 years ago, but that might be just my very small pigeonhole of a, of a vision. The one positive aspect that I will say is in my, in my, um, recent information management working group meeting in Honduras, we were talking about, um, and I'm gonna struggle with the vocabulary here, but because usually we have to disaggregate data by sex and gen sex and age. So gender and age, sex and age disaggregated data. Uh, and then, but we had a whole uh, panel discussion uh, with an expert who was, who was explaining to us how can we integrate um, alternative genders or third genders and, and what do we do when the country itself is not monitoring um, different genders within their own set statistics and stuff. So how do we make sure that the, we're not invisibilizing, I don't know if that's a word in English, we're not making people invisible by refusing to recognize their gender. So how do we turn, how do we make sure that the data doesn't ignore them basically. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool. I have to do more research on it, as you can see. And, and if I, I can add just one thing, because I saw in, in the chat, someone said that they've applied for so many jobs and haven't received a response. I think something also that I wish I had known starting out is, you know, I, I also applied for so many different positions and didn't hear anything. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of positions, but you just have to keep going um, and, and keep trying. I think that's that's another message that I would have. Well, I think that takes us to our, our last question for today. And so this is a question that I, I love asking when I'm, you know, having virtual coffees or in-person coffees, but, uh, you know, what's one piece of advice, you know, knowing what you know now, what is one piece of advice you wish you could tell, you know, your undergrad self? I, okay. Uh, so I didn't, I thought I wanted a law degree right out after my undergrad and I didn't get it then. And I always wondered, should I have done it then? And then I kind of came around to it. So I wish I had just told myself to relax. Um, yeah. Well, Emily, yeah. I think, I mean, I think similar to me, uh, I think I stressed out a lot about the exact career path and how to, how to get there. But I mean, it, you know, in, in the end, uh, you know, I think I, I kept doing things that I enjoyed and I was passionate about. And, um, and then I ended up in, in a role that, uh, that I really enjoy and, and, and is great. So um, I, I, I wouldn't, as long as you're on that, that path and um, have an idea of where you wanna go, um, and are, are happy and, and passionate about what you're doing, then um, I, th that's the advice I would give to my, young, my younger self. And Emily Ann. I, I'm really struggling with this. <laughs> I, I, I gotta be honest, I've, I, I, my college degree was in music, so I really didn't know where I was going. So uh, the only advice that I would give myself was like, buckle up, it's gonna be a hell of a ride. Um, but I mean, obviously, I, I'm not saying that I didn't have to go through all of the, the, the applications and, 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 you know, knock on the doors and all that. But um, I, I think proactivity, constant proactivity and, and learning what I can contribute to whatever the project is, is something that I developed over time. I wasn't necessarily very proactive as a young 20 year old. <laughs> um, yeah, so be proactive. And the, 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 the other thing that I would say, if I can add a last comment, is um, along the way, people will tell you you can't do something um, or, you know, what your goal is can't be done. I was told that a number of times. And, um, and you just have to kind of try and believe in yourself and, uh, and, 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 and go towards that goal. Thanks, Will. And thanks, CM. And thanks, Emily Ann. I think the, the one thing that I've heard, the consistent messaging is keep applying. Apply, 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 leave no stone unturned, you know, network, put yourself out there because we all face a lot of no's, a lot of rejections, but it's just about, you know, picking yourself up, putting in one more application because all you need is, is one yes to open the door and get your career going. Um, so with that, you know, again, I wanted to thank the, the three of you for taking the time to chat. It was wonderful to get your insights, your perspectives, 
hear about your career journeys, your, you know, your, uh, you know, your, your pathway. And uh, thank you to our, our participants. You know, it was wonderful connecting with all of you. I hope you, you got something out of this. I'm going to make a plug here for the Canadian International Council. If you're interested in, in future CIC events, you know, please, uh, you know, please do join us. Uh, we, it's a network of engaged professionals in foreign policy, security and defense and Canadian politics. You know, we host regular events like this all the time. And one of our big focuses is, is really focusing on youth and young professionals and hosting events like these to better equip you so that, you know, like Will said, you know, we can help equip you with what we wish we had uh, back when we were in undergrad. So I'll put a link there in the chat here. You know, that's a link to become a member. And the final thing I'll say is that uh, we are looking for a mentorship coordinator. So if you're looking to get some board experience, if you want to join the CIC at the National Capital Branch here in Ottawa is looking for a, uh, a young professional who is organized and enthusiastic to lead our mentorship program. And this is a program where you get to be paired uh, at the undergraduate level with a young professional and where, with a young professional to an experienced professional to get more advice and insights and one-on-one and -on -one mentorship about you know, ways to, to build and develop your career in, in a variety of fields. So with that, just want to thank you all again. Uh, really enjoyed connecting with you all and, uh, and uh, don't forget to check out our website. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for attending everyone. Have